Space Mountain. When the original version of this attraction opened in the Magic Kingdom in 1975, it transformed not only Tomorrowland, but the wider theme park industry as well. Using new computer technology to track multiple trains across its layout, Space Mountain helped to pioneer the modern roller coaster, showing that technology had advanced to the point where larger capacity considerations could be implemented. Still, what also made this attraction so innovative wasn't just its technical capabilities, but also its theme. Housed inside its iconic dome, no one had ever experienced a roller coaster like this before. Flying around in the dark as projections of stars and asteroids zipping by made it feel like you were traveling in a rocket through space. In fact, it was so popular, numerous other parks attempted to emulate the experience with attractions such as Black Hole at Alton Towers, Space Center at Fantasyland, and Eurosat at Europa Park, among many others. Of course, with its immense popularity, Disney would build a new, smaller version for Disneyland in 1977, and would bring versions of this to other parks as well. The version in Tokyo would open with the park in 1983, based on the Disneyland layout, and the Hong Kong version would do the same in 2005, but would instead be a clone of the new Disneyland track that was installed the same year as part of a rebuild. So, what's the best version of this attraction? They're all iconic in one form or another, but there's two that really stand out from the rest. The first is Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind and Epcot, which you cannot convince me is not just another space mountain. If you removed the IP, very little of the experience would actually change, and you would be left with another roller coaster through space. However, the focus of this video is going to be the version of the attraction that opened in Disneyland Paris in 1995, which manages to distinguish itself not just through its intense track layout, but also through its unique Jules Verne theme. The original version of the attraction, known as Space Mountain de la Terra a la Lune, or in English, From the Earth to the Moon, was arguably Disney's best version of the ride, which has unfortunately been gutted through a massive rebranding, and most recently, turned into a dumping ground for a permanent Star Wars overlay. So let's dive into one of Disney's saddest downgrades, and explore what was once an iconic symbol of how great Disney Imagineering used to be. Quick reminder, but if you enjoy videos like these, you can do me a favor by hitting the like button. It's no secret that Disneyland Paris, which opened with the name of Euro Disney in 1992, didn't meet the financial expectations of the company. In fact, this extravagantly detailed and incredibly expensive park was losing money in its first few years of operation, with attendance being far lower than predicted and guest spending not meeting expectations. There are a lot of reported reasons for why this was the case, but high-profile criticism of the time has highlighted how this park was perceived as a form of American cultural imperialism. This, in addition to not respecting French culture and tradition, and not understanding European holiday practice, all contributed to its failure in its early years. However, one thing that I can recognize the park for doing is opting for Discoveryland instead of the usual Tomorrowland. In the late 1970s, Tony Baxter, a high-profile Imagineer who had a large hand in the development of Big Thunder Mountain, Splash Mountain, and a number of other attractions, conceptualized an expansion for Disneyland called Discovery Bay, inspired heavily by Jules Verne and existing as a steampunk-style land with multiple attractions. While many of these ideas would manifest throughout Disney parks in one form or another, Discovery Land is a great spiritual successor and really made sense for Euro Disney, since Verne was such an influential French writer. One opening day attraction included an ambitious Circle Vision 360 film known as The Visionarium, which was later cloned to other parks as The Timekeeper. Other attractions included a walkthrough exhibit of the Nautilus from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and versions of other typical Tomorrowland attractions such as Autopia and the Astro Orbiter, but with a retro-futuristic interpretation. Discoveryland also opened with Star Tours and Captain EO, 
which thematically doesn't really make any sense, but at the very least they were hidden away in highly themed show buildings that fit with the overall aesthetic. However, the land itself was conceptualized with something much more ambitious in mind, anchored by a massive building known as Discovery Mountain, which would have been twice the size of Space Mountain at Magic Kingdom. Inside, it would have been designed around a mysterious island based on Verne's novel The Mysterious Island, and under its dome, it would house a number of large attractions. Originally, the Nautilus walkthrough was conceptualized for this space. It would have also included an underwater restaurant. Other attractions include a drop tower coming out of a volcano, based around Journey to the Center of the Earth, as well as a clone of Epcot's Horizons. Most notable, however, was Discovery Mountain itself, an indoor roller coaster existing as a version of Space Mountain, but obviously themed to Verne's From the Earth to the Moon. The plan was too ambitiously expensive, and so Discovery Land obviously opened without it, but the idea clearly lived on. Your destination, outer space. Your speed, astronomical. Your closest encounter, asteroids. Between the Earth and the Moon lies the adventure. Space Mountain, the greatest ride in the universe, at Disneyland Paris. As the park struggled financially, Disney really needed to introduce a brand new and exciting headliner that would draw in the needed crowds. Working off of the Discovery Mountain concept, this version of Space Mountain was essentially the same thing, but had its own single purpose show building. Opening in 1995, it absolutely did bring in the needed attendance, and the park finally turned a profit with its introduction that year. The exterior of the building is designed to look like a mountain cannon from which riders will be shot to the moon and the attraction concept follows the Jules Verne novel pretty closely. On entering the queue inside the building, guests walk through Stellar Way, an open area where they could view the coaster flying through its track layout, interacting with and looping through its various elements. Before reaching the station, riders would move through a portion of the queue that is meant to be the headquarters of the Baltimore Gun Club, which was responsible for the construction of the cannon in the story. From here, the queue ends at the open-air station, which has an iconic steampunk design. The trains themselves were called Moon Trains, designed to look like 19th century vessels that aesthetically fit Verne's science fiction. Also notable is that these are the first trains to ever feature synchronized onboard audio, with a music piece specifically designed to coordinate with different moments in the track layout. Once the train departs the station, it curves around a bend and falls into a small dip, then moving upwards into the launch hill inside the cannon. The train parks and the side rotates open as if riders are being loaded into the barrel. The train then ascends a little bit further in and parks again. As the music continues building, it suddenly breaks into a new section and the train launches forward through the cannon into the darkness, cresting a hill and quickly descending down a left banked turn past spinning asteroids. The train then flies through more asteroid fields and finishes this section of the track by twisting out of control through its first inversion, a sidewinder. It quickly snaps out of this into a transition that brings it through an asteroid mining machine from the novel, which is an element you can see pretty clearly from the queue. Almost immediately, the train blasts through an asteroid which uses smoke effects to simulate impact, and the train then continues descending to the right, flying past asteroids and moving through a corkscrew. Riders slow down quickly as they lose momentum and climb another small lift hill, with a projection of the moon with a face simulating their rapid approach. This may seem strange, but if you've ever seen the 1902 silent film adaptation of the novel known as A Trip to the Moon, this is what it is intended to reference. 
The train quickly crests the hill and descends again, flying through more asteroids and its final inversion, a cutback, before letting effects simulate burning in the atmosphere on the return to Earth. The train then pulls into a brake run through a machine called the Electro D Velocitor, which absorbs the momentum of the projectile train, and from here, riders pull back into the station. Space Mountain, from the Earth to the Moon, is certainly one of the more unique Disney coasters out there, and while its intensity with the launch and three inversions is more akin to Rock and Roller Coaster, and its intensity isn't for everyone, I think it made sense specifically for Disneyland Paris as a much needed thrilling attraction. While there's a lot to love about the other versions of Space Mountain, the Jules Verne theming here is so unique and distinct from the others, yet manages to still maintain that Space Mountain spirit. I also like how it successfully brought riders through such an interesting queue that let people look directly into the coaster track itself, which is such a unique element that could only happen in the Eisner era. Space Mountain from the Earth to the Moon was arguably not only the best version of Space Mountain, but was an example of the best that Imagineering had to offer. So what happened to it, and why does it now exist with a permanent and half-baked Star Wars overlay? In 2005, the exterior of the dome was repainted, the interior changed, and the ride now renamed to Space Mountain Mission 2 as part of a refresh to remarket the attraction. With the failure of the obligatory Walt Disney Studios Park opening across the way in 2002, Disney's Paris Resort found itself needing another financial boost to keep it afloat, and what better way to do so than introduce a brand new e-ticket? Or, I suppose in this case, changing out some signs and removing Space Mountain's interesting theming in favor of a more generic rebrand. Space Mountain certainly saved Disneyland Paris once, but it was stupid to think that a new coat of paint would do it twice. On entering the queue, fans of the previous ride would immediately notice that the former Stellar Way was now enclosed, removing what was once an iconic element of the experience. The theming and queue aesthetic itself also changed to be more akin to the generic space mountains found throughout the other parks. While this isn't necessarily a bad thing, it is disappointing because the Jules Verne theming was an interesting way to differentiate this version from the others, and the external steampunk ornamentation and canon were still in place, despite not playing into the story of the ride anymore. The ride experience itself is also immediately different, using a new score composed by Michael Giacchino, who also did the updated soundtrack for the new retracked Disneyland version as well. Admittedly, I actually preferred this audio track over the previous one because it's just really good. As for the interior itself, many of the elements such as the asteroids stayed the same, but this time used new lighting to make them feel more dynamic. Moving further in, former fans would notice that the asteroid mining machine was removed, and the lift hill where you approach the moon was replaced by a projection of a supernova. The area where you re-entered the Earth's atmosphere was also upgraded, using a much more effective lighting effect before then concluding again with the Electro de Velocitor, which wasn't removed for whatever reason. While Space Mountain Mission 2 was not a bad version of the attraction, and actually improved the impact of certain elements throughout the ride, many of the decisions made in this refurb were just strange, such as closing off Stellar Way, or removing some of the Jules Verne thematic elements while still keeping many of the others. It seems clear to me that a lot of the positive lighting changes would have made sense with the previous theming. Still, while this new refurb of the ride stinks of late Eisner era cost cutting, you can also count on Bob Iger and Bob Chapek to somehow make things worse. The attraction closed in January of 2017 and reopened in May of the same year, introducing completely new trains which you will notice are distinctly steampunk themed and sporting a temporary overlay as Star Wars Hyperspace Mountain to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the ride. By temporary, I mean that this Jules Verne themed structure with new appropriately themed trains has now been running this Star Wars overlay into 2023, which is ridiculously stupid. I'm very much a fan of overlays like these, as Hyperspace Mountain at Disneyland is a nice change for the month of May, and I really like the Haunted Mansion holiday at the end of the year. However, these temporary overlays are, appropriately, 
temporary, and you're not at all better than the core experiences. While Space Mountain Mission 2 had its thematic issues, it's still a much stronger version than Hyperspace, which shoehorns in TIE Fighters, Star Destroyers, and X-Wings in a way that doesn't really gel with the pacing of the ride. Again, stuff like this is fine if it's a temporary or seasonal overlay, but it's clearly not a good fit for a ride it wasn't designed for. Is it not bizarre to walk into this Jules Verne themed land and structure, only to experience a forgettable Star Wars overlay that has long outstayed its welcome? Like many things to find in this era shaped by Iger and Chapek, Hyperspace Mountain exists as a reminder that there's absolutely no care for the integrity of the theming or quality of the park experiences, as long as you can slap a marketable IP onto something. So, this is the story of Disneyland Paris's Space Mountain, which premiered as an incredibly unique attraction, not just because of its intensity, but because of its unique theming. It was then first rebranded cheaply, and has most recently been turned into a billboard for a film franchise that Disney has run into the ground. I hate how current leadership does not trust consumers to want to experience something cool, but instead had to slap some marketable gimmick onto it, resulting in the last half decade of forgettable mid-tier attractions that leave a stain on the Disney Parks brand, once known for its abundant creativity and high quality. If you're frustrated and you agree that this is the wrong course for Disney to be on, then one way you can help change the narrative is by leaving a like if you haven't already done so, boosting this video and allowing this sentiment to gain more exposure. As always, if you enjoy this video or others on the channel, you can also hit the subscribe button with bell notification so as to be alerted to new videos as they release.